uh, welcome to the last event of this year international conference organized by the human rights, the Antonio Papisca Human Rights uh, Center of the University of Padua. I am particularly grateful of having been invited to chair this last event. It is an honor and also it adds on the honor the fact that I'm particularly interested in the topic that you tackled yesterday and that we will go into deeper details today. Uh, I want to also, so a big thank you to the organizers, the human rights in general, and specifically Pietro De Perini, who has done an amazing job. I know because I have witnessed the process in the past few months. Uh, of course, all the scientific committee, but let me express my highest and largest gratitude to the speakers of today's roundtable. Uh, thank you for giving your time to us. It's very, very worthy and, and, and we value it very, very much. Uh, today's roundtable wraps up uh, the conference and I hope it will be an opportunity to have a synthesis, some kind of uh, pulling the, uh, the, the conclusions on uh, the different panels that uh, were organized and held uh, yesterday. Uh, my name is Sara Penicino. I am here because I love working with the Human Rights Center staff in general and with my colleagues that work there, but also because I am the president of the master degree in human rights and multi-level governance. Therefore, our collaboration is very, very tight. And we try as much as possible to bring human rights work uh, in its most contemporary form in the classrooms. Our students are very focused on the issues of human rights and they choose us because we do try to offer them a very, very contemporary perspective on what it means to carry out human rights work. Do we always succeed? We don't know, but for sure we try very hard. So thank you to the speakers of today's panel, uh, of today's roundtable. We have two speakers that will participate from remote, i.e. you're going to see them on the screen behind my back. Uh, but I would start first with uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Kairat Abdrakamanov, who is the uh, ambassador of Kazakhstan that took up the mandate of OSCE High Commissioner on National Minorities on December, on the 4th of December of 2020. Ambassador Abdrakmanov joined the Kazakhstan Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1993 and held a number of key positions. He also served as Kazakhstan permanent representative to the OSCE from, 20, uh, from 2007 to 2013 and chaired the OSCE Permanent Council in 2010. He was instrumental in organizing the first OSCE summit in 11 years in December 2010, during which the Astana commemorative declaration towards the security community was adopted. Uh, thank you very much again for being here. The way we thought we would organize this round table is to have speakers intervene for uh, 10 minutes and then open the floor to uh, questions and possibly wrap up with a little comment by all our speakers may be triggered by a question of the chair. So I would invite His Excellency the Ambassador to take the floor and address the audience. Thank you very much. Uh, distinguished participants, uh, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, I am really honored to be with you today to contribute to the discussion. My special thanks uh, go to the University of Padua. I am, in fact, speechless. This is my first visit to this beautiful establishment. Uh, and uh, I am very much honored to be invited by Human Rights Center and I and my, dele my delegation enjoying each and every moment of staying here in Padua and meeting you. And I'm, I see in front of me quite a diverse uh, audience, and most importantly, I have representatives of the young generation. So, future belongs to you, and many messages which I am going today to deliver uh, depend on you, the implementation. Uh, uh, in order to save time, with your permission, I will uh, read out my text. In, in order, on one side, to save time; on other, on other side, to be precise and to leave some time maybe for further discussions. 
uh, dear colleagues, uh, I'm uh, representing, as you say, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe as the High Commissioner on National Minorities. This institution was, was established 30 years ago uh, in the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is now the organization. My mandate is to provide early warnings and early action to prevent conflicts resulting from tensions involving national minority issues. I engage in quiet diplomacy and provide tailored expertise to the 57 OEC participating states in support of their efforts to develop and implement policies that facilitate the integration of their diverse societies. Uh, dear colleagues, the global security landscape is being reshaped as we speak with the potential to fundamentally transform the security environment in the OEC region and beyond. Conflicts between states are on the rise, some of them also feeding on ethnic divisions, which are often amplified by political and religious rhetoric, socio-economic divisions, not to mention misinformation and propaganda. War in Ukraine is a case in point. It has had devastating consequences. It has killed thousands of people and imposed significant suffering on the entire population, the results of which will be felt for many years, decades. The war has also been the pinnacle of a trend in international relations toward the so-called instrumentalization of minorities, which is the opposite of upholding and implementing the international human rights instruments that make up minority rights. Since the creation of my institution in uh, 1992, uh, my mandate of tensions related to national minority issues has not ceased to be a relevant factor in conflict and war. In fact, it is quite the opposite, as these tensions, tensions have increasingly been one of the causes of conflict. My key observation, however, is that national minority tensions do not originate from underlining minority majority or intermajority relationships in diverse society. Instead, national minority tensions and subsequent conflict are far more often caused by the ways in which states or non-state actors manipulate diversity for their own political gain. Whether related to ethnicity, language, or religion, most intercommunity tensions are created through state manipulation of these identities in a way that fosters divisions in society instead of fostering harmony and social uh, cohesion. This manipulation of diversity occurs not only domestically, but may also occur outside of its border. Now, it should be first be acknowledged that states may have an interest in supporting persons belonging to national minorities who live in other states due to ethnic, cultural, linguistic, religious, historical, or any other ties. My institution has recognized this point of international law in its Bolzana Bozen, it sounds familiar for you, recommendations, on national minorities in interstate relations. However, this does not imply in any way a right under international law to exercise jurisdiction over persons belonging to minorities on the territory of another state. The territorial integrity of states remains the cornerstone of international relations, including the legal provisions of the UN Charter and the political commitments in the OEC Helsinki final act as well as um, the Astana commemorative declaration uh, has been mentioned, the one and only document of political nature adopted in this organization in the 21st century, uh, the one and only. So sad to uh, admit this uh, fact. Therefore, I stress that it is not diversity itself that it is, is the challenge needing to be fixed. Rather, my institution has long been concerned about and indeed deplores states' practice aimed at instrumentalizing 
and exploiting minority issues abroad. Dear participants, the logical follow-up question for you and me is how to increase the resilience of our diverse societies to internal and in external instrumentalization of minority issues that can lead to, con to conflict and war. How do we prevent states from manipulating diversity both domestically and internationally? The most significant tool to encourage states is um, our international law norms. The various international legal instruments on minority rights, as well as the UN Charter and other conventions, uh, established uh, the standards according to which states are, are to act toward national minorities, both inside and outside of their territory. They are the only common standard of achievement to which the entire global community has agreed and through which a unitary response can be galvanized. Although my institution is not a human rights advocacy, I am not ombudsperson and I do not have any protection mandate, it is important to recognize that human rights are an essential tool in conflict prevention. Protecting and promoting human rights and averting conflict are two sides of the same coin. There cannot be any meaningful and sustainable conflict prevention or resolution without upholding minority rights within a robust, democratically legitimate, non-discriminatory and human rights complaint rule of law system. This is a precondition for just, equal and cohesive society that can withstand tensions and avoid um, conflict at the earlier stage. More states, most of time have taken human and minority rights seriously, implementing them into their domestic systems and upholding them in the foreign policy. I gladly and acknowledge the progress that has been made in this regard over the decades since modern international human rights have been formulated. Uh, in fact, during the 30 years of its existence, my institution of High Commission on National Minorities of the OEC has witnessed many advances in the design and the adoption of inclusive legislation and institutions, and in the overall integration of diverse, diversity in their societies. States implement human and minority rights for many different reasons, and various institutions and actors call for compliance from different point of departure. A purely human rights approach affirms normative and legal reasons why human rights should, should and must be followed. With its conflict prevention mandate, my institution has a broader scope. In addition to normative and legal reasons, I can also take a more practical approach appealing to states or individual leaders' self-interests. Individual leaders, obviously, we are talking about political leaders. Uh, first of all, my institution can quietly coax compliance by demonstrating that it is the only sustainable path to peace and stability and the social and economic benefits that secure the future of the state or its political leaders. From all of these points of departure, human and minority rights have had a positive effect for countless numbers of people in most states in the world. However, ensuring that states act in a manner that puts human rights and indeed minority rights front and center appears to be an increasingly serious challenge amid what I see as human rights backsliding across, in my particular case, the OEC region, and uh, you, you may uh, judge about your areas of res responsibility and um, interest. This is a progressively overwhelming challenge for states, for civil society, for minority communities, and importantly also for international organizations such as mine. Normative adherence as well as normative enforcement have fallen victims to states, prioritizing other interests, which has given political space for the deterioration of human and minority rights. In essence, human rights have not failed us, but we have failed human rights. Over the years, my office has developed a set of guidelines and recommendations, and one of them been mentioned, in a number of policy areas relevant to national minorities. While not legal standards themselves, they aim to assist the 57 OEC participating states to strengthen 
integration and the resilience of their sites. In many ways, they bring forward minority rights as a topic, and among them, we are talking, we are highlighting education, the use of language, rule of law, policing, media, participation, and interstate relations. Allow me to highlight that just a few weeks ago, my institution marked the 10th anniversary of its comprehensive thematic publication, the HCNM Ljubljana Guidelines on Integration of Diverse Societies. A core principle in these recommendations is that facilitating the integration of society and respect for diversity is one of the most effective tools to prevent conflicts and render societies more uh, resilient to outside interference. With these lessons in mind, I've been communicating to EC participating states that responding to this war in Ukraine and resulting security challenges required, requires not further marginalization of national minorities through reactive responses that securitize national minority issues. Instead, states should react with even more attention to minority rights so that persons belonging to uh, national minorities do not fall victims of uh, geopolitics. If I may allow me to highlight that I consider the most relevant aspects of minority rights and HCMM guidelines recommendations uh, given uh, the um, present security situation. Education in minority language should not be restrained but strengthened, as well as the allocation of adequate resources and incentives to promote mastery of official languages. Both of these are required to simultaneously value diversity and enable the integration of society, as well as to facilitate opportunities for employment and uh, mobility. We should strike a very relevant balance between proficiency in state language and mother tongue language, especially in the sphere of education. Bans on the use of minority language in public space should be avoided. Multilingualism, whether appropriate, should be cherished and promoted. The closing of minority media channels can in some instances be, per be perceived as a legitimate security necessity, but opportunities to access domestically produced content in minority language should remain available. Controversial monuments do not have to be destroyed, but instead can be an opportunity to learn from the past. Efforts to fight hate speech and hate crime including against minorities should be strengthened as well as sufficiently communicated to the public. Participation in all spheres of life should be promoted, including through consultations in order to assure that everyone in society has an opportunity to be heard. And this is very relevant to the legislative process. If any legislation um, where interests of national minorities envisaged should be, should be adopted only after the thorough consultations with representatives of minorities. Dear colleagues, I now come to our responsibilities as the international community, including the OEC, through its institutions, mechanisms, and policies. International law norms should be consistently interpreted by all parties based on sound critical reasoning rather than on political expedience. Only when we all pull in the same direction can we hope to hold the increasing global disregard for international norms and law. Any divergence between us could be exploited and may weaken our standards and instruments, and as a result, increase conflict potential. I remain hopeful for the future. The modern international system was founded from the scourge of war and ushered in a generation of relative peace and security when states recognize that adherence to international norms and principles uh, was in their best interests. The present security landscape with open warfare 
by the OEC participating state against another could be a new catalyst toward the reduction of instrumentalization of minorities and the renewal of minority rights. My institution remains committed to its role in tackling the challenges ahead, and I take great comfort in the knowledge that we are not alone in our shared efforts to support justice, equality, cohesion in a society. And please, I am so pleased that this conference plays an important role in, the, in this endeavor. And I hope that discussion here will enable us to understand what measures need to be taken to in establishing peace and stability across the OEC region and beyond. And lastly, I, and last but not least, I want just to mention that uh, your findings, especially of all these stalwart academics uh, participating in this event, very often used by my, uh, my office uh, when we are elaborating on issues of our interest and falling under the mandate of HCNM. And we are thankful and grateful to all of you. And my hopes also with this, as, as I mentioned, young generation, please do, give, do be uh, engaged also with my office and we will value any piece of your contribution to the implementation of my mandate, which is, as I mentioned, about conflict prevention. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your speech, which uh, contained a number of tips that for a constitutional lawyer that engages with human rights are particularly interesting, but I will save all of my ideas for the end, so I'm not going to uh, steal time from the other speakers of today's roundtable. I will therefore leave the floor and pass it immediately to Mr. Jean Fabre. Jean Fabre is a former high-level UN official and international expert on social and solidarity economy, a graduate in physics. He has been a conscientious objector and long-standing activist, engaged in France, in Europe, in battles for civil rights against nuclear power and against poverty and hunger in the world. An official and then deputy director of the United Nations Development Program, in Geneva, he contributed to the promotion of the Human Development Index and the drafting and implementation of the Millennium Development Goals. An expert on social and solidarity economy, he is currently a member of the Scientific Committee of the International Forum for the Social and Solidarity Economy and an advisor to the United Nations Interagency Task Force on Social and Solidarity Economy. Thank you again for being here. We appreciate very much you gifting us your time. The floor is yours. I prefer to see you and so that you can see me also. So I, that's why I stand, I stand here. Um, <clears throat> the ambassador said, human rights have not failed us. We failed human rights. And this is my starting point, in fact, for what I have to say today. Whatever we have, we are harvesting what we have sown. And we have to understand that because we shouldn't just cry over what happens, but we have the capacity and the, the ability to change things. I am a child of the United Nations. I'm not saying that because I have worked for and with the UN for about 40 years, but because I was born shortly after the UN was created. And I grew with it and I saw the progresses that were accomplished thanks to the UN and some other multilateral organizations. And I saw also the limits of what uh, could be achieved. And I'm thankful really for what uh, the UN has delivered. I mean, among things, you have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You have the creation of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. You also have on very practical things, 15 million people who have been saved from river blindness. You know, there's uh, an insect that goes on the rivers in Eastern Africa. And those 15 million people see today, they would be blind were it not for the UN. A joint program with the UNDP, the UNICEF, the World Bank, and, and the WHO. So we have all sorts of good things, but I don't have illusions. Despite progress, we have failed in a number of things. I am part of the first generation in the history of humankind 
that had the capacity and the means to end poverty and hunger. Today, as I speak to you, every six seconds, a child still dies of poverty and hunger. This attention by all of us. You have two billion people who are not equipped at home to wash their hands. You have one billion people who don't have access to electricity, and you have 800 million people who don't even have lat latrines. Now, this is a shame in the 21st century. And I have to beg forgiveness to all the young people who are in this room today. I have to beg forgiveness because my generation is guilty of something and is to have turned your future into a nightmare. And I'm saying that because if we go on with business as usual, within, you know, when you reach my age, you will have enormous changes with climate change, a very difficult situation to manage, um, pollution of the seas, pollution of the grounds, uh, energy shortages, uh, you know. So all these things uh, are, are important, but at the same time, the 2 billion people who are under 14 now in the world are the first generation in the history also who will have to reconceive the social pact, the economic pact, and the environmental pact that unites their communities. And they will not be able to do that on a local basis. They will have to do it on a global basis. Why? Because there's one fact that we always overlook. It is the fact that since the United Nations was created, we have all become interdependent under certain aspects. Simply by the fact that then there were 2.4 billion people in the world. We have reached 8 billion with the technologies that we have, with the way in which with our ecological footprint on earth. We're all dependent on the same things. And so because of that, we are interdependent. And that creates opportunities because it means that the reality will force us to do certain things or will force our leaders to do the things that they are not doing. But if we are not asking them to do uh, certain things, it's, don't expect them uh, to, to, to do that. They are caught in, 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 in certain things. And this is why we have to be activists, not just analysts. And I want to challenge a little bit the title of this conference. It says, bringing human security back to the global political agenda. Well, I would say put human security on the global uh, political agenda. It was never there. You know, in UNDP, we launched that concept of human security in 1994. Uh, now, in fact, think of something. When we offered the Human Development Report to the world and proposed the Human Development Perspective, it was a subversive act. And the Human Development Report is a subversive tool. What we wanted to do initially in 1990, when we issued the first Human Development Report, was to shift the attention from the obsession that people have about the GDP, the gross uh, uh, national product, or the, you know, towards what matters. When you meet a friend, what do you say? Do you ask, what did you produce last week or last year? No, you say, how are you? So this is the only relevant question. How is humanity faring? And, and how can we improve the situation? So yes, indeed, uh, in some quarters and at the UN also, there was a, uh, in, in, in 2001, there was a commission on human security that was created. And in 2012, there was even a resolution by the General Assembly. But um, what matters is really what 
governments are doing, what countries are doing, what uh, local uh, authorities are doing, and what we are doing as individuals. Now, the concept of human security, it was just to say, if this concept of human security had been at any moment on the political agenda, you would have seen part of the funding that goes to the armaments or to the, the, the military that would have been transferred to civilian purposes. We didn't see that. So there has been talk and that's fine and good, but we have to walk the rest of the way and, and put uh, really the security of people in their job, in, uh, in terms of food, in terms of their environment, in terms of uh, safety also, uh, in, the, in, the, in the streets, in terms of political rights, uh, at, the, at the heart of things. And, <clears throat> and for that, we have to, to, to work. And yesterday, uh, Karen Smith was telling us, you have to fight for human rights. So we do have to fight for human security, as we have to fight for, for, uh, for, for the rest. There's a paradox um, that we have described in a new human security report that hasn't been mentioned yesterday. But in February, UNDP issued another report on human security. And it shows that despite the fact that people live longer lives, are uh, more educated, uh, uh, and, 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 and so on and so forth, that there's a perception of insecurity which is growing. And it's not just due to COVID, it's due to many things. So, um, and we have new uh, emerging uh, threats that we have to uh, take into account. And this report insists on the fact that we have to consider not only the human security of individuals and communities, but we have to uh, also consider the interdependence among people. And therefore, uh, also, uh, that has to be reflected in, in our priorities. And this is why Agenda 2030 is so important. But you have to use what the UN produces. Uh, you know, because uh, the UN is two, it's a two-tier uh, institution. You have the staff and you have the bosses. The bosses are the governments. It's a meeting room. You know, if you put the bosses together and they, you can make them agree, that's fine. If not, at least you can do certain things. We receive information from the entire world and we uh, can analyze things. And then we can project ourselves 20 years ahead, 40 years ahead, and see what has to be done. So um, yes, we have to add solidarity uh, into the picture. But if you look at what we have done in the past, we didn't do well. In 1970, at the UN General Assembly voted a resolution whereby rich countries should dedicate 0.7% of their wealth every year as of 1975, every year, and 1% as of 1980. We are at 0.33%. So we have 42 or 47 years of debt towards people who are uh, not so well off as we are in the richest countries of the world. And no, no wonder that things couldn't yield the results that we should have, and that we still have uh, one child. It's not every four seconds, it's now every six seconds who dies, but you know, it's, a, it, it, it's something that, that cannot be admitted. So, what we have to do is we really have to understand how we uh, can take the agenda uh, forward. So now it's time to rethink a number of things. You know, uh, in economics, uh, the first uh, so-called economist, uh, Adam Smith, who wrote The Wealth of Nations, 
1776. In fact, when he wrote The Wealth of Nations, it was conceived as the ability to carry a war, to conquer something. Colonialism uh, was uh, strong after that. And we still are in the logic of confrontation, uh, power games, when we are in a totally different time, you know? We are all on the same boat. Some people travel first class, some second class, some third class, some down the hall uh, of, the, of the boat, but we are all members of the crew. Whether we realize it or not, we're not passengers. We're all members of the crew and we, uh, what we do makes a, makes a difference. So we have to reconceive institutions, multilateral institutions that are adapted to the 21st century. The UN uh, that was created and the institutions that were created were created on the basis of, of the, the ideas of the time and the situation, the world order uh, of the time. It's a totally different thing. No, the first computer on which I worked was as big as this table. And it, it, you know, it, it didn't do a, a tenth of what you can do with that. Not even a hundredth. So, you know, things are, are totally changed, not only for that, but the interdependence and the fact that we are exhausting some minerals, some, some uh, energy sources and all that. So we have to work totally differently. So we have to rethink our institutions for the 21st century, but we'll do it if we, if we put the right issues on the table. So um, we have to, uh, we have to bring these issues. And part of that is the digital world. It, it, it's all good and fine, but it also brings a number of dangers, including cyber wars, including the use by criminal organizations of these extremely powerful tools. You know, not only uh, some uh, were able to equip themselves with lethal arms, which is bad, but you know, uh, if the permanent members of the Security Council are the biggest arms sellers in the world, you know, no wonder, but where is the campaign now to stop arms sales? That there used to be at the time when, as you recall, you know, go in, in, into the army. How do we challenge the notion, the respect or the lack of respect for human rights? Think of one thing. At the end of World War II, the Nazi criminals were judged on the basis of a text that didn't exist when, you know, during the war, when the acts that for which they were judged uh, were, were, uh, were done. It's the principle of Nuremberg. They define what is a crime against humanity. And those principles have been adopted internationally since then. And they say that uh, the preparation of a crime against humanity is also a crime against humanity. And the complicity in a crime against humanity is a crime against humanity. Tell me something. Does the use of a nuclear bomb respond to the definition of a crime of human against humanity or not? There's nothing that is more a crime against humanity than that. So when we pay our taxes, in a country where the nuclear deterrence is the, the philosophy of defense, all 
citizens in the country are criminals against humanity. And today, we are under threat of maybe an escalation in a war that may lead to uh, years like that. And we let that thing happen. We don't stand up, we don't bring that thing uh, in, in the international courts of justice or in the, in, the, uh, you know, in the right institutions. We should challenge things, you know, if we let things go, you know, um, I've noticed during my time with the uh, UNDP that when I visited members of parliament, ministers, uh, in order to encourage them to contribute resources, that hardly anybody questions them about that. If you don't interrogate your representative in parliament about certain things, why do you think that she or he should bother about that? Some people are good hearted and well minded, but they're not the majority. So we have to interact uh, constantly uh, with, with uh, these people and we have to build something. Marco Masha, Professor Marco Masha, yesterday was telling us that care is the new name of peace. Yes, indeed, we have to build a culture of taking care of each other. What we're doing with the economy is just the opposite. It's just the opposite. We are all pitted against each other, competing between individuals, between enterprises, between countries, you know, when we should be teaming up. We're using the needs of people to make money. We are not serving the needs of people and making sure that, you know, everybody enjoys all the rights that are in the Human Rights Declaration. So we have to change the economy. At least we have to make grow that part of the economy that puts people above profits. And it is possible everywhere in the world, you have hundreds, tons of examples of people who are doing things well. Even in Zurich, the sixth most expensive city in the world, a fourth of the new constructions are housing cooperatives. They are between 20 and 50% under market prices. And on top of that, they're ecological. Now, what? Best can, can you dream? And that's people who organize themselves to do that. And sometimes with the help of local governments. So we have to build pacts, agreements, and, 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 and be in that and, and build the, the society of the solidarity instead of that of exploitation. We can do it. I mean, Pope Francis launched an appeal to the young entrepreneurs, young uh, economists and young change makers of the world to give a soul to the economy. And a few thousand people, young people are doing that now, but they don't have to start from scratch. Many things are happening. For those who are in Italy, go to see the site Italia che cambia. Uh, you will see there are so many things. Uh, two journalists went on a tour with a little van uh, to see some of the positive things that people are building without waiting for the authorities to do them. And they thought that they were working for 10 days, you know, but they kept receiving news of other things that were happening and they were on the road for seven months and seven days. And then they created that site, Italy that changes. And we could do that on a global basis. Uh, we can build the culture of peace and the culture of peace is the culture of taking care of each other. And the culture means the practice because what we do speaks louder than what we say. 
And, you know, my children, when I do something and they say, you know, daddy, you say that we have to rest, but you don't sleep at night. Um, okay. Okay. You've got a point. Um, you know, it, we always live by, by, by example. So, uh, and then I'd like to uh, quote Professor De Stefani, who yesterday uh, told us about the movie, The Consequences of Love. Now, honestly, bring something to the attention of people. If you keep measuring what's wrong, like with the human Durham report, you know, I was saying, if you look at the GDP, the growth of the GDP, you know, you can add up pears and apples. Uh, one thing and the opposite of the thing, you, I, I build a car, I sell it. We use the car to transport uh, food or to take somebody to a hospital and it's positive. You make an accident with the car, uh, two people are dead, two people are injured. Uh, the, the expenses for the funerals and, and for uh, curing uh, uh, these people and, and the garage, you know, all that uh, adds up in the GDP. So you have the positive and the negative things to the point that in the UK now they include the revenues from prostitution in the GDP and from drug sales. Okay, so, so you have to measure what you treasure. If you start shifting things by measuring what you treasure, then the attention is put on something else. And that's where you have the, the consequences of love, the possibility for people to open up to something else. And, and, and mind you, I mean, this is, this is within reach of hand much more than uh, we think. And we should never let some of the violations of human rights happen without speaking up, without standing in solidarity, without organizing solidarity with the, the, the people who uh, are, are suffering uh, from that. One example, very small one, violence against women. The way in which a number of women are treated by men, frankly, I'm not, I'm not proud of, of, of a number of us. But we are the ones who have to campaign and to stop these things. We shouldn't let the victims lead the struggle. So this can apply across the board to everything. I, to conclude, you know, the UN has offered something to the world. <clears throat> that structure of the civil servants who are in the institutions has focused attention on a number of issues. And that's how in the year 2000, after a series of conferences in the 90s, we managed to obtain the Millennium Development Goals. That is to say, the goals that were approved in the year 2000 and that had to be reached by 2015. When I joined UNDP and I talked about poverty eradication, my colleagues were tapping me on the shoulder saying, oh, okay, calm down, Jean. Uh, poverty has always been with us. If we reduce poverty, it's already a success. And I said, but you don't say, uh, we never talk about the reduction of torture. No, why should we, uh, why should we uh, then uh, not apply eradication, the word eradication to poverty and hunger and, 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 and all these things. So um, and goals had as an objective to halve poverty, the proportion of people who are in extreme poverty within 15 years. 
And mind you, that objective was reached in an uneven way, but it was reached. And because of that, governments all of a sudden opened their eyes because, uh, you know, after all, who wants poverty? You may want wealth, you may be greedy, but you don't want necessarily people to die and to be miserable. And you can even be richer if, uh, if they're well off. Um, so you can also uh, think in a certain way. So, uh, you know, so that's what made it possible in the year 2015, as we came to the end of this period of 15 years, to adopt the 17 so-called sustainable development goals. That's what we call Agenda 2030. By 2030, we had to reach a number of goals that include the eradication of poverty. And mind you, these are not objectives set by government. They are a commitment that has been made by the governments of the world. A commitment, it's written there. Now, what do you see in your respective governments? Are they putting that as a priority? Are they on track? No, we are off track and the war the wars, not just the war in Ukraine, the wars everywhere are pushing us further off track. So we have to be back on track. And so but we have to speak up. Don't let them get away with it, you know, with no, not doing what they promised they would do. It's written, it's a promise that was made. Hold them accountable. But do your part of it you know, by changing the economy, by, by doing uh, whatever uh, is win, within reach of our hands. Frankly, if we all set to work on putting Agenda 2030 as a top priority in all our countries, we can make enormous changes. We can get a long way and we can be putting human security truly on the political agenda. It is within reach, but we have to pull up our sleeves and do the job. Okay? We'll do it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jean Fabre, for reminding us of the uh, individual reach that every one of us has in, in not only supporting, embracing, but actually implementing it on a daily basis, uh, the principles that relate, I'm thinking especially, especially of solidarity. Again, apology for referring to constitutional law and the national level all the time, but it's, it's a professional uh, consequence, exactly. So the, the, the principle of solidarity as it is entrenched in many, many of Western constitutions of the post Second World War, it, I think it, it, it requires some refreshing uh, framing, even at a national level. So your words are so inspiring. And again, also to the speaker that intervened earlier, I, I salute your skill of taking a very global universal uh, concepts, very global concepts and just take it down and make it relatable for, for us at an individual uh, level. So we're now gonna move on with our next, uh, next speaker. Um, the next speaker is gonna be Christina Kokinakis. Uh, Christina is intervening, uh, Ms. Kokinakis is intervening from remote. I think she's online. I can, I can see her, hi, nice to you. Nice to meet you, nice to see you. Hello. Uh, Christina, hi. Christina Kokinakis is Director for Values and Multilateral Relations uh, and Deputy Managing Director of, Man uh, of the Managing Directorate Global at the European External Action Service. She has over 26 years of experience in foreign policy and multilateral diplomacy, first with the Austrian Diplomatic Service and then with the European Union first and the United Nations. Thank you very much, Christina, for taking the time to be with us. The floor is yours. 
Yeah, grazie tantissimo a lei e molti saluti um, a, a voi in Italia. Um, unfortunately, I could not uh, be there in person uh, due to other commitments, but many, many thanks for um, having invited me. Um, previous speakers were already extremely uh, inspiring, I have to say, and touched upon many things. I'll try to, um, to um, put out a couple of uh, points uh, which were raised or uh, on which I think we could, um, we could um, do or dwell a bit longer. And then um, well, I'm trying to, um, to, uh, to share some, um, some of our um, reflections when it comes to human security and how to put it back to the global political agenda. Uh, in terms of human rights, peace, and of course, multilateralism. Well, um, I think we all agree that um, global challenges are growing and um, that uh, they make multilateral cooperation as relevant as never before. At the same time, we also all agree that multilateralism is uh, facing many challenges. Uh, multilateralism is in a crisis since a couple of years. Um, but this is um, also a possibility for us to look at it much more positively. So to see the glass half empty or half full, this is um, this is here the question. And um, and uh, I would I tend to see that um, the current challenges multilateralism is facing is a sort of uh, opportunity for us now to take um, globally and universally agreed values further. Um, if you look, uh, the UN have been mentioned uh, several times already um, uh, this morning. Um, if you look at our common agenda, a big um, project of the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, which um, enjoys the full support of the European Union, it is ultimately um, about ensuring human dignity and human security for everyone, following the principle of non-discrimination. So human rights should apply to everyone without any distinction. Um, we all agree that um, it is centered on the human person, and this is good so, and that people, including the youth, which is one of the, um, of the future um, and, and big current topics at the UN, but also children need to be given a voice to, um, to, to add to this, um, to this uh, global multilateralism, multilateral effort. So for us, for the European Union, it is a priority that multilateralism is truly inclusive. What does it mean inclusive? It means it needs to in include not only governments and the traditional stakeholders, but of course also civil society, more and more the private sector. Think of uh, public um, private partnerships and other key holders uh, which, um, which are adding their voice um, to the table when discussing multilateralism. And this is, um, this is also why the UNSG's call for a new social contract um, can be a potential game changer for, for, the, for the UN. The EU's expectations are ambitious um, and um, they are outlined in the strategy that um, is called a renewed multilateralism for the 21st century, the EU's agenda. This is one of our basic documents when we talk about uh, strengthening and making uh, multilateralism more effective. Um, the strategy outlines, uh, just to explain a bit, the commitment to continue to work both in, in, in the context of uh, conflict prevention, but then also looking at strengthening global health system, uh, think of the, um, of the COVID pandemic, um, just an inclusive societies, but also everything that has to do with climate change, natural resources, and, um, and of course, uh, human rights and democracy for all. Ladies and gentlemen, um, as, a as, a, as a first point, uh, when it comes to multilateralism, uh, I need to stress that multilateralism is obviously subject to continuous adaptation. And this is something we need to, uh, to deal with. Um, this, uh, the adaptation is much more speedy than what we, uh, what we were being used up until now. 
it um, it moves faster and it puts us in front of many different new challenges. Think of digital, think of new and emerging technologies, and think of the challenge how to put the human rights-based approach to, um, to the digital um, environment. Um, mm, some speakers already uh, talked about, um, about the founding of the UN, which is a product of World War II, but I'd like to underline as a second important point to me that the fundamental basis of international law is obviously the UN Charter. This is something where all 193 uh, UN member states signed up. And this is what um, I think it's more relevant than ever to try to preserve the, um, the UN Charter. We've seen recently with the, uh, with the war, um, the unjustified and unprovoked um, um, war of Russia against Ukraine, that um, the UN Charter is more and more violated. So violations are becoming uh, more, um, are, are continuously there. Um, and um, for us, when we talk about how to ensure that this global rules-based order, that this global effective multilateral system um, will be more effective, it is about first of all, preserving the UN Charter. Um, you all remember the, the resolutions we, um, uh, the UN General Assembly was adopting in the course, um, in the aftermath of the invasion, um, which um, had a huge amount of yes votes when it comes, when it came to, um, to reconfirming um, the principle based on the UN Charter, namely sovereignty and national integrity of the countries. So um, I think this is a concrete example where we all demonstrated, namely the international community, that multilateralism is based on a global rules-based order and that it is extremely relevant and that we must commit to uh, safeguard um, international conventions, to safeguard international law. This was also shared not only by the European Union, this is why I mentioned the over 140 yes votes, but this is a, this is a principle that is universally shared. And I think this is, this is one of the, uh, of the points we should, um, we should touch upon, how to uh, make sure that universal, uh, universality of human rights, universal values are, con are, continuously, um, um, are continuously promoted and respected. Um, and this is, um, and in, in this endeavor, it is relevant that the EU looks for partnerships, looks for alliances, both with like-minded, um, but also with the not so like-minded, trying to um, refocus on our common vows. So reconfirming our vows is definitely something we should, uh, we should look at. In this context, let me mention accountability and the fight against impunity, which again, in the context of the war in Ukraine, but not only, um, becomes also more relevant um, day after day. Um, ensuring that, um, that there is no impunity is, um, is one of the, of the important aspects to make multilateralism work, to make multilateralism effective, and to safeguard um, international conventions. Um, let me add a, a couple of, um, of, of, of challenges where uh, we will need to focus on, uh, to focus on in, 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 the, in, in the coming months. One is obviously environment, climate change, and, um, and um, um, uh, environmental challenges that have obviously, if you think in terms of nexus, strong um, repercussions and challenges when it comes to human security. Um, conflict prevention is um, and mediation is uh, is a topic where the European Union and the UN are working closely together, which is obviously another another important point to make human security work and to link it well with um, with um, with the pillar of um, of peace and security, and of course anything that has to do with uh, with digital and new and emerging technologies. Um, 
for the European Union, it is important to link the three UN pillars closer together, the peace and security one, the development one, and of course, uh, the, human, um, the, the, the human rights one, which is still, unfortunately, always um, uh, named as the third pillar and which has, is still the pillar which has um, the, um, the, the, um, the smallest budget. Um, Interdependence between um, the two covenants when it comes to human rights is, um, is another objective and another uh, goal I think we share universally. Interdependence between the civil and political rights, but also the economic, social and cultural rights. Um, one word maybe to add on the peace and security from the side of the European Union, the EU is leading on, uh, on uh, many uh, CSDP missions and operations, so these are conflict, uh, this, this, is, uh, this is the common security and defense policy of the European Union, this, the, CS, uh, the CFSP. And, and the CSDP, and there we are also trying continuously to, uh, to instill a human rights based approach. And let me um, maybe let me um, finish by, um, by by coming to I think to to, to one of the of, of the points with which we started today. Um, I'm the director for uh, values and multilateral relations at the EAS. Values is is obviously something um, we do not see as only European values, and this is a very strong strong point from, from from my side. So values means definitely universal values. Recommitting to universality of of, of human rights is crucial, especially when we look ahead of um, at 2023, a year where we will have lots of human rights anniversaries. The most um, important one, the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but also the 30th anniversary of the Vienna Declaration Program of Action, which reconfirmed universality of human rights. I think um, for us, it will be important not only to look back, to look back at this um, extremely meaningful global universal uh, uh, multilateral system, but to look also ahead. And this and 2023 might be a good opportunity for that. Um, reconfirming, as I said, our vows, looking at which conventions and um, which international covenants we already have. Implementation is an issue, so really forge implementation of, of everything we have, but then also look ahead in order to be able to tackle new challenges, such as digital, new and emerging technologies, uh, climate change, etc., and how to make sure um, to, um, to have a secure, a safe, and um, to create an environment where human rights uh, will be respected. I think this is, I think we, we, we're ahead of a, of a huge, hugely challenging decades to come, um, but we have the instruments, we have, um, we have all the conventions, uh, we just need to implement them and to look ahead maybe at some new topics where um, possibly we could, uh, we could further engage and where there is um, possibly some further need to, to regulate um, on a global basis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Kukinakis. I, if I may, I, I, I do place some hope in your vision that 2023 could be a shifting year for, for the, the world in general, but mainly for the European Union in strategic terms. And if I may, there is something as a European citizen, uh, which is not something I gained, I just received it. So it's, it's not because I did anything well, but as a European citizen, I have to say that I feel the pressing need to remind myself and my fellow citizens of, of what, we believe, what we are, who we are, and which are these values that you were mentioning that on the one hand are universal, but on the other, maybe also represent who we are at the, at the core of it. Right, there's not a lot of other things we have in common, if not our mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. uh, belief in common values. So thank you, thank you very much. This was really uh, inspiring, and in line with what was said before. Uh, so we are now going to move on to our next speaker, who is Miss Lena Simet, 
Lina Smet is a senior researcher and advocate on poverty and inequality at Human Rights Watch. Her research focuses on social protection, labor rights in non-standard forms of employment like the app-based gig economy, and on how austerity-driven budget cuts and the privatization of basic essential services can undermine human rights. Lina is a member of the Coalition for Human Rights in Development Steering Committee. I welcome her. And I'm going to leave her the floor right away. Thank you again for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and hi, everyone. I apologize for not being able uh, to be with you in person. And uh, I also want to apologize ahead of time if any, um, any part of my presentation is um, incoherent. It's very early in the morning uh, for me in, in New York. So uh, <laughs> bear with me. I, I prepared a couple of slides. I hope that you can see them as I start sharing them. Um, let's see. Please do let me know if you if you cannot uh, see them. Uh, yes, we can. There they look perfectly. Okay. Great, thank you. So um, essentially, and and um, I really would like to also share my confirmation or. Um, um, agreement with many of the comments that have been done previously on uh, the importance of bringing human rights uh, to the agenda as part of a, a human security um, approach and would like to share some thoughts and reflections of our work um, at Human Rights Watch in light of the war in Ukraine in particular, which I think has many lessons uh, learned for, for broader um, situations of, of conflict um, and war. So as you as you all know, uh, well, I imagine um, Human Rights Watch has documented the um, the many of the atrocities that um, that occurred since the invasion of Russia and Ukraine. So so we're talking specifically about apparent war crimes, the impact on on civilians, um, and also forcible transfers of Ukrainians to Russia. But what is often less um, reported on is the, the huge economic impact um, that comes with war, especially if we look at situations of poverty, as well as economic inequality and people's ability to um, secure an adequate standard of living. So this means having uh, nutritious food, having adequate housing, having your right to health secured as well as safe water and the right to education. And many of these situations are um, are severely affected in in the warring countries, but also in um, in the region the countries are situated in, or have global repercussions, as we are seeing in this particular conflict. Because Russia and and Ukraine are um, key exporters of agricultural products, so the Black Sea area exports um, about 12% of food calories traded in the world. Um, and they're some of the main wheat um, exporters to regions, including the Middle East and North Africa, but also uh, several countries in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that those are the, the regions we, um, we conducted research on earlier this year. The impacts have been immediate, where we saw rising food prices, and in turn, um, challenges in people's ability to afford food. But we also are very much concerned about the lasting impacts since the, the harvesting season has been impacted and therefore, um, and the planting season also has been impacted, therefore affecting coming seasons, but also fertilizer prices having increased tremendously, um, which in turn, is likely or is expected to affect uh, the production um, of goods elsewhere. And even though net importing countries have been particularly affected, even those that import little from the two countries have experienced indirect impacts from the higher world prices of key commodities, um, especially wheat, which has been uh, received more attention, um, especially earlier this year. And so what, how, how we would like to frame it is that we have seen a crisis on top of crisis. 
since we have already been in a difficult um, situation where people's economic and social rights have been severely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as is now further strained by climate change driven um, weather events, such as the recent floods in, in Pakistan, which severely impacted um, the av availability of food as well as food production. So many countries have really seen a, a very concerning reversal of achievements in previous reductions uh, to poverty. And here I just wanted to show you some um, a chart of the FAO uh, food price index to demonstrate the, the rise um, and the, the immediate um, rise of food prices um, earlier this year. However, I should mention um, that food prices had been on the rise prior to um, the, the invasion um, of Russia and Ukraine. Um, however, the war have further driven up prices. And I think these numbers in part are from uh, March and April when, um, when the food price index reached the highest levels since 1974. So very, very concerning levels of high food prices, which in turn affect the afford affordability of food uh, for many countries, as well as for many households. And wheat prices in particular, again, have increased uh, by 40%. And that was just between March and, and February. And yet, despite these very alarming situations, we, we noticed that in the global response and in um, whether that's the response to the war in particular or um, in multilateral um, conversations that the economic rights aspects are insufficiently considered. We also see that many countries are not equipped to well respond uh, to such crises of economic and social rights and have very inadequate social protection systems that therefore fail to protect people's economic rights as shock after shock um, has affected their ability to um, an adequate standard of living. We are also very concerned about uh, what's to come as countries have taken on more debt during the pandemic and um, are now facing, in some situations, are, are facing uh, rising threats of austerity um, fiscal consolidation, which means cuts to um, essential so social spending that are um, so important to protect, especially people's economic and social rights. We have already seen some countries cut back on their commitments to overseas development assistance, which can therefore further impede um, their ability to protect um, economic and social rights. So all of these steps are, are very concerning and, um, and we therefore suspect that the next year um, will be a difficult one um, for people's economic situations. And just to show you a couple of, of numbers in terms of the severity of food insecurity, even before um, the war broke. And some of these numbers are from, um, from Sub-Saharan Africa. So you see that in, in, in several regions of the continent, uh, food security or food insecurity have already affected more than half of the population and more so people uh, living on low incomes. So food inflation is therefore particularly harmful um, and risks to reinforce situations of inequality, both um, at the global level, since higher income countries are more apt to, uh, to respond to crisis, um, economic crisis situations. However, also within countries, as low income earners are, are, have already spent um, more than half of their incomes on food and therefore are uh, facing difficulties in, um, in weathering uh, food inflation and are therefore forced to, to skip meals, to purchase lower quality food, or reduce other um, essential expenditures, including on education, on health, um, or housing. And I just want to show you two uh, brief examples of research that we have conducted in, in Lebanon, um, a country in the Middle East, where poverty has been extremely high, um, affecting about 80% 
of the population um, as the country is undergoing a severe economic crisis since, um, since even before the pandemic started. Social protection coverage is extremely low, especially for people working in the informal sector. And the country used to import 95% of wheat from Ukraine and Russia together. So the, the beginning of the war has therefore um, um, led to skyrocketing wheat prices in the country. And um, due to the economic crisis situation, the central bank was unable to continue to subsidize um, wheat for, to ensure affordable consumption domestically. And uh, we have therefore seen protests um, emerge, um, erupting um, as well as alarming situations of food insecurity. We conducted um, a, household, a representative household survey in, in Lebanon earlier this year, demonstrating um, just the severity of the situation where one in four adults um, had to skip a meal uh, because of the lack of, of monetary resources. 20% of, of the households ran out of food in the previous month. And the bottom 20% of earners being particularly affected where more than 40% uh, went a full day without eating. And uh, households with children and those uh, uh, and female headed households were particularly at risk of uh, food insecurity. We saw a very similar situation in Nigeria where I won't go into details for the sake of time, but again, um, a country that is a very heavy importer of wheat uh, from, uh, from Russia and Ukraine and has seen alarming levels of, of food insecurity and food inflation in particular. And as we have heard on, on to, in today's discussion already, as well as in yesterday's presentation, there is a vicious cycle between conflict, poverty and hunger where conflict breeds hunger and uh, hunger and poverty in turn can lead to more unrest and conflicts. And we've seen that in uh, following the, the, the 2008 financial crisis and the food crisis at the time, as well as more recently, where in Sudan, for instance, um, uh, um, a heavy cut in, in wheat subsidies and rising food prices um, led to an overturn of the government or um, or already unrest um, erupting in, in Kenya as well as Cameroon. The BBC, in fact, reported that since 2021, the rising costs of living have driven protests in more than 90 countries. So again, we, we need to really be considering um, the, the repercussions that the economic situation can have on, um, on broader security aspects. And there has been some um, I would say some uh, optimistic movements in recognizing these, these relationships earlier this year, where the UN Security Council has led a, um, a session particularly looking at um, concerns around food insecurity and hunger. And um, as the G20 is meeting next week um, and discussing food insecurity as one of their three priorities. However, the, the, the response has been insufficient, inadequate um, in, in what we can observe. So I want to leave you with a couple of reflections on, on what should happen and, um, what, and what needs to be done. On the one aspect, of course, the, the war in, in Ukraine should end immediately and unconditionally. However, more broadly, we need to hold states uh, to, um, to account uh, for the duty to respect, protect, and fulfill economic, social, and cultural rights. And uh, from what we can observe, there has been, although there is an, an absolute interdependence and interlinkage between political and civil rights and economic and social rights in the implementation, we continue to see quite severe differences between the two. And one concern, especially as we engage with governments, is often the, um, the misconception, let's say, between immediate obligations that states have and the progressive realization of rights, which therefore should not be an excuse for insufficient progress. Um, because even, even countries with, um, um, with lower incomes 
uh, can make uh, progress in ensuring food insecurity. However, there needs to be a global response and there needs to be international cooperation and solidarity in order to make um, that happen. So if we look at food in particular, this means that food exporting countries should uh, keep the impacts on other countries in mind as they try to carefully consider export restrictions to protect right to food domestically. Importing governments in turn should work to ensure that nutritious food is affordable before, uh, before cutting subsidies and further uh, leading to spiraling prices. And uh, sanctions placed on, on uh, warring countries such as Russia should also consider the impact of, um, of economic and social rights, including the right to food um, and the impact on, on food security in particular. And finally, we need to think more broadly about solidarity in reversing um, economic precarity that is often rooted in structural discrimination and legacies of colonialism that have, let, um, have left low-income countries more unable to respond uh, to economic shocks and the, the extreme weather events that we are seeing and that will likely um, become worse in the coming years. One way to do so is uh, thinking about a global fund for social protection where higher income countries can better support low income countries in establishing and maintaining social protection for floors in the form of entitlements. But we should also keep international financial institutions in mind, such as the uh, International Monetary Fund or the World Bank, and uh, who should refrain from pressuring countries to adopt austerity measures that can be very harmful for, uh, to human rights and affect um, economic recovery for decades. So, so this means really breaking the vicious cycle of armed conflict, poverty, and hunger, um, also by reshaping the global food system, which has uh, left um, countries often very dependent on Im uh, food imports rather than um, working on, on more sustainable local agriculture systems. So to end, um, I would like to reiterate what I think what we've also heard from previous speakers around um, what, what it means to bring human security to the agenda. And I really think it means um, having a better consideration and a stronger consideration of um, economic and social rights and thinking collectively of, of um, how um, international inequality as well as domestic um, inequality and poverty um, can better be addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lina Simet, for this uh, wide, comprehensive uh, presentation of the uh, connections and the possible consequences of war on human security and specifically on food uh, security. Uh, we are now approaching our last speaker for today's roundtable. Uh, his name is Jihad Namur. And again, I thank you also for taking the time for being here. Uh, Jihad Namur is the academic coordinator of the Arab Master's Program in Human Rights and Democratization, which is part of the Global Campus of Human, of human Rights. He is a lecturer at the Institute of Political Sciences. His uh, legal theory and political sociology are his area of expertise, and he holds a DEA in Law and Political Science from St. Joseph University. His latest research focuses on forced migration, and he develops educational programs with several Lebanese NGOs. Thank you once again for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? It's fine, yeah. It's a very humbling experience for me to speak in a venue like this one and in a panel such as uh, the one we've, we've seen. So um, uh, this event has certainly been for me um, one in which I learned a lot, so I hope that I'll be able to slightly contribute to it um, in, um, in this um, and to its discussion. So I'll try to share with you uh, my perspective, uh, one stemming from the Arab world and from regional program in human rights and, and education, one supported by the, the EU, 
um, in its uh, policy to support human rights and human rights education. So um, very briefly, um, um, the program is part of a larger network of about 100 universities in which uh, the University of Padova is, is a key player uh, through um, obviously um, Antonio Papiska's uh, work and drive, but also the one that's continued with his spirit uh, by the Human Rights Center. Um, in our program, um, so our program is, is the youngest of the seven regional masters, soon to be eight, uh, joined by the Bishkek Academy. Um, so um, we, we, we started operating in the midst of um, the Arab Spring with the idea that human rights education had something to, to uh, had a role to play uh, within this, uh, this dynamic. And we have partners in Morocco, in, um, in Tunisia, in uh, Palestine, in Lebanon, and also not formally, but we also have ties with uh, um, Egypt uh, and Jordan. So when um, I received uh, the, the, the questions and the idea of participating um, in this panel, I was wondering which entry point uh, to take. And the one that I think the most uh, relevant uh, for us today is uh, to look into the role of human rights education in such a context and how it can address these issues that we've been discussing for two, two, the past two days of human rights, peace, multilateralism, and also uh, human security. So um, um, briefly, um, the positive thing about uh, the Arab Spring in its two um, waves, one of the early uh, 2010s and one that came at the end um, of, uh, of the decade, was that it showed the world, but it also showed us in the region that we are not immune to change, that there is hope uh, in change, that we can mobilize politically, and we could actually even force regimes out of the game. Now, unfortunately, we've seen how this played out. And it didn't play out again because of any innate quality, you know, uh, kind of region, regional immunity to political uh, change and to democracy and human rights. It played out because of very specific dynamics in the region um, and dynamics that not only countered uh, the, uh, the Arab Spring and reversed its um, uh, dynamics, but also increased general skepticism towards human rights and democracy. And uh, the, so we have, we can go into many examples and see how this played out. You know, it's the only region in which there was no regional support for democratization. Um, and there was very little exterior support for it as well, if you compare it to other waves uh, around the world. And um, not only that, we, you had actually a lot of support for counter counter revolution, for counter um, for people, you know, going against the ideals of uh, of these revolts. So either through uh, the support of um, autocratic uh, tendencies within the country, um, or through the support of armed groups, and this was the case in in almost all countries, and. Uh, as a program, so we have exchanges of students and professors coming from all these um, universities and regions. So also beyond the partners, so we have people also lectures from from Sudan, lectures from Mauritania. So it's it's extremely diverse, and so is um, our our so our students. And um, and what we noticed while we're doing activities with and exchanging with with Tunisia, and that was already four years ago, was a general skepticism towards democracy and human rights people were just not convinced about it. And this trigger, triggered a reflection in our program. How do we address that? Um, and we actually had um, an activity last March on that issue, and we hope to develop it uh, as a program, a research program in the future. Um, and the idea was, should we be addressing skepticism towards human rights, or should we be doing something else? and looking into the reasons behind that skepticism. So um, obviously um, the skepticism we could is tangible, not only in our 
in the public events we do um, with our discussions with uh, with our partners in civil society, but also in our classrooms, which is interesting. So we're talking to students who are skeptical about the very themes that they're working on. And um, we know where this comes from. So um, when it comes to human rights, um, it's not seen, it's kind of seen as a set of lofty ideals that are irrelevant to people's everyday life. Um, this comes across quite often when we talk about human rights. Also, there are some sets of rights that are equated to foreign intervention. Um, so as in, in a lens that is that of the legacy of colonialism. So this is the other, another way of, of that uh, expressing itself today. Um, when it comes to peace, and that's particularly true for minority rights, minority rights protection, that, uh, because most interventions came in the name of protecting minority. Little weight that word carries in a region marred by wars and military interventions. And military interventions that are not officially wars. Huh? They're just sometimes carpet bombing. You have drones coming in. There's no formal declaration of war. It's just military interventions. Um, and in which peace is associated um, with what's going on between um, in Palestine with Israel and uh, the Arab states. And where we could see, you know, today we, we, we remember, uh, the, we, we talk a lot about the Abrahamic um, Accords, and some have rightly criticized it as very transactional, you know, it's like kind of a business approach to, to peace. And, but this is not new. It was exactly the same principle be, behind the Camp, da Camp David Accords. It didn't bring real peace, real collaborations between Egypt and, um, and, and, and Israel, like it didn't bring any peace to Palestinians, although it was part of the accord formally. Here with the Abrahamic uh, Accords, it's not even part of, uh, of the agreement, just Palestine is not really covered. Um, so, so it's just allowing a space for business to operate, either business between states or business within the states, so Suez Canal, uh, and obviously um, the economy uh, in, in Israel. Uh, because it would suffer less from, from the risks of uh, warfare. So this is peace. You know, as you can see, it's not very something you can dream about. Huh? It's something that's very limited and has very limited consequences on people's everyday life. And, and then there's a third concept, which is that of uh, multilateralism. And there again, um, you, the, you have... Too negative. How can it's not really negative? But the thing is, this word is usually associated with um, a kind of new order, uh, either regional or global, in which um, people cooperate and deliberate, and they kind of form an another level of society. You know, uh, like you mentioned, this uh, the, the European citizenship or even a global citizenship. So that, that's the idea behind um, our, you know, our quest for multilateralism, right? And how do we see that in, in our region? Well, the first one probably is this traumatic experience of the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, which was an international uh, decision. And that hasn't really been addressed up to now. Um, it's, we're talking about uh, armistices and peace, but we're not looking into the core issues of that conflict and how to really solve that conflict um, and all the repercussions it had. One of them is the emptying of the Arab world of its Jewish population, which is also quite traumatic. You know, uh, it's probably one of the biggest traumas in Iraq. And it, pre and it started this wave of impoverishment uh, of, its, um, uh, of its diversity. You know, uh, at the beginning of the century, a third of Baghdad was Jewish. Um, so, and it's the longest presence of Jews anywhere in the world. So we're not talking about a small event. We're really talking about something that really changed the lives of everyone there. And, and then if we look at it regionally, we see something else, um, which is uh, the, the Arab League of States, which is not exactly a success story either. Um, so it's one of the oldest uh, regional organizations, and it certainly is one of its the weakest, uh, the least developed. Uh, the one that does everything to actually prevent integration more than actually work for integration. 
And with the only images that we, we have of it is, is that of uh, world leaders gathering uh, to discuss things that will have no meaning or repercussions to anyone. Um, and some people like, ironically regret the times of the more colorful Arab leaders that at least put some fun into watching their, uh, their discussions. And, um, and then also another idea, see uh, the failures of multilateralism in the region. We had something, or it still exists on paper, basically the Gulf Cooperation Council, which everybody only a decade ago was predicting that it was going towards uh, an economic uh, union with even a common currency. And th there's no trace of that either. So it's a, it's a bit of a world, uh, how can I say, it's uh, the law of the jungle and where states' interests uh, are of the foremost importance. Um, so these are for the three concepts and also the question of human security. Um, it's, very, it's very difficult to convince people regionally about, you know, about the importance when they're living what they're living, when they're undergoing the type of uh, impoverishment that we're having in Lebanon, or occupation, or civil strife, or repression uh, by their own governments. So it's, we're talking here about ideals that do not immediately resonate um, in, in people's um, minds and hearts. So when this view, um, what do we do? So as a human rights educational uh, program, so how do we address the issue? So obviously we start by addressing, um, so instead of addressing skepticism, we do something else. We engage with skeptics, which is a different approach. Um, and engaging is not converting them. Engaging them is really talking to them and seeing why they don't believe in it and how we can change that. Um, a second approach uh, is, as I said earlier, addressing the reasons behind the skepticism, but how do we do it? So obviously we're in the university, so we do it through education. So uh, passing on knowledge and skills, but also a certain attitude, a certain set of values. Uh, research ethics, you know, academic uh, freedoms, and the idea that it's our duty also to speak truth to power. And here I'm not only talking about military power, it could be also obviously financial power, just speaking the truth. And giving our students the space and the tools to become actors of change. Um, the second uh, way to address the reasons behind skepticism is through research. And this is also working on uh, democracy. It's very important to gather data and there is a lot of, we don't have much uh, to work on. Well, we, we do, but we have really to, to find ways to get it out. Just give a small, a small example. Um, so the, the, we worked on that. I, I worked on personally in another project a couple of years ago. Um, we couldn't estimate the volume of goods that were imported in Lebanon. This is usually something quite easy. And for example, you, 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 everybody has. So we received a very unconvincing, we're not received, we looked into and, and the, the publications and we, and, and we, we got uh, the declarations of the port of Beirut, which is the principal port uh, in Lebanon, about what it imports. And figures were not very convincing. So what we did was we looked into the ships that came in and uh, left their cargo. And then we looked into what they had declared before leaving their ports of departure. And we saw a huge discrepancy. So you cannot trust figures uh, at all. Um, another interesting, um, you know, show how much research is important, data is important. Uh, when you talk about Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, so there was a general consensus that we had half a million Palestinian refugees. And everybody was pushing that uh, figure, except Israel, very skeptical about that, uh, that figure, and rightly so. And there was a general push to look into the numbers. And through the USA, we actually did the census, something that we don't have with the Lebanese population. And the last census was done at the beginning of the 20th century. And so there was a census of the Palestinian uh, population and the figures 
were extremely low, about, about 100, um, less than 180,000. So from 500,000 to 180,000. So as you can see, um, well, there, there are some questions on, on, on how it was done, but probably much closer to the truth and quite accurate in comparison to the half million. But there you had a vested interest of all parties to, to fly a number, one fear-mongering within the Lebanese uh, communities to say, look, a big threat, so look at their numbers. So if, and now we have a similar dynamic with the Syrian uh, refugees. And also uh, quite a vested interest in international organizations as well, because they're underfunded, and so they need to have large figures to be able to um, uh, to uh, justify the, the, what, what, what they have to receive and for Palestinians to show the scope of the problem. So everybody was working on these numbers. So research and data gathering is very, very important. This is why also we, we encourage our students to go there and we, to, to, to go into data, um, to go and create, you know, enrich uh, our knowledge um, of human rights. But also that's why we created this a community of uh, experts and lecturers who uh, I, um, so I mean um, university professors who, who 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 work on expanding the knowledge. So it's not only about transmitting, but also expanding and and having students as um, our main collaborators in that expansion. And um, the third way is through our international collaboration and our comparative approach. Uh, so one of them is to get away from any type of exceptionalism um, and to see how things were done elsewhere and also how things are done differently between different countries on that issue. So these are the three, basically the three ways in which we try to do that. But we're doing it and we're very conscious, conscious about it. We're doing it in times of shrinking civic spaces in the region, not only in the region, but I'm talking from the region. And academia seems to be one of the few remaining spaces in which we can actually rekindle hope and preserve the values that we believe in. Um, but it's a fragile one. And what we're witnessing today is um, a wave of a new wave of brain drain. And this is um, affecting most countries in the region uh, for either political reasons. So you can imagine um, it's not always easy to be working in some of the countries. Uh, uh, for security reasons, but also for financial ones. Uh, because of economic collapse, you have a lot of our colleagues from different uh, universities who are leaving. Leaving, interestingly enough, not only to Europe and to the USA and to, uh, to, to Australia, etc., the usual uh, countries of destination, but also now to the Gulf region, um, where they, they get, well, obviously, more access to funds, but not necessarily more academic freedoms, but sometimes they do. We have one, one exception where, the, where they, they do actually have that and it's becoming, and it's in it's one center in Doha, it's becoming one a center of knowledge production in, in the region, even in human rights, which is a bit ironic, but it's, it's, it's the case. Um, now, in our discussion, we, we kind of felt, felt that these, during these two days that Ukraine has really felt like a watershed moment uh, in when it comes to these issues, uh, at least for Europeans. In, in our view, this kind of happened much earlier. And probably it's the invasion of Iraq that triggered a bit the same questions that are being triggered over here, which was basically uh, founded on false pretenses uh, without going into the the international law and and how warfare is supposed to be engaged and that literally destroyed the country you know there's an expression that we we had in the region that says a lot because i'm saying i'm saying that because um, um the media coverage of the war of iraq most of you are too young to remember here but uh was centered around its uh its autocratic leader saddam hussein not only Saddam Hussein, but he was only referred to by his first name, which is also quite odd, Saddam. Um, and, and that was about all the coverage that people had and his supposedly big fifth, fourth and fifth biggest army in the world, which, which was, was, was quite a sham. Um, and, um, and that was the, the only, uh, this is what, that was the image that Iraq was reduced to. But in our region, we viewed Iraq very differently. 
um, we had that expression that says, uh, Cairo writes, Beirut publishes, and Baghdad reads. Um, and it was very true. N today, none of them <laughs> ring true, but that was the case up to uh, the late um, 80s. So that's the kind of society that Iraq had, Baghdad had. So one that reads, one that creates, uh, so um, uh, with strong infrastructure and in education, you know, in, in general infrastructure. And what we had after the invasion was a completely destroyed country uh, in its infrastructure and its educational system. And it still is today. It's not um, a coincidence that the Islamic State was born out of Iraq and from Iraqis. So, so for us, that was really the watershed moment. But that doesn't mean that it made us, especially in academia, skeptical towards the human rights, uh, multilateralism, and peace. On the contrary, like you here, uh, after uh, the invasion of, uh, of uh, Ukraine, it made us even more thirsty to, um, to, to work for change, real change, and giving back um, the, these concepts, these their true meaning and rekindling this hope. Now, I hesitated about how to end that speech and how I could end it on a positive one. Unfortunately, I can't. <laughs> but the only thing that I, that I can say is that I don't believe there's another way to, to reach the goals that we have that, and a better way than actually human rights education. Uh, exchanges like this one, um, kind of getting out of our comfort zones, of our received ideas, seeing perspectives from a completely different view, and, and also maybe, and that's what we do on a regional level, um, try to give hope to a new generation and to ourselves in, 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 this, in, in such situations, but not hope as wishful thinking, but hope through what we're transmitting, hope through the research that's being done, uh, hope through the identification of good practices, uh, the identification uh, of, pro of new projects, of new goals, as, as, uh, as you had expressed with the Italian site. And, um, and I hope that we, we were able to, to, do, to transmit um, not only this, um, these, these, these ideals, but also give back their meanings huh, to, to, the, to these words. So getting human rights out of conferences rooms, for example, this is the horrible things, um, uh, into the field, it, out of hotel lobbies, which is the worst thing that we have mm -hmm. in the region. You know, any type of discussion on development, human rights, and humanitarian law is done in four or five star hotels. Uh, beautiful resorts, and then we wonder why people look strangely at, at us when we discuss these issues. We're not very convincing, are we? So, so it also means doing things a bit differently, engaging with reality differently, and um, it's not easy. And we, and personally, I'm very thankful to all these collaborations that we have um, that are inspiring, that allow us to build on each other's experiences and move these uh, um, your core, core concepts and ideals further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Namur, for this inspiring uh, speech. It's a personal perspective, but I subscribe everything that you said, and I think we're on the same boat. I, I, I appreciate all of your words very, very much. Um, I think we have a few minutes for a couple of questions from the floor. If anyone has a curiosity, yes, we have one question in the back. I don't know if the organizers have, we have two questions. Okay, I'm going to collect these two questions and then we can gather answers. All right, there you go. And then we're going to wrap up the session. Can you please say your name? Yes. Stand up. So <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Hello. So my name is Fabricio. I'm a researcher, a postdoc researcher at the Polish Academy of Sciences in Warsaw. And I have a question to Christina. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting to see 
uh, how uh, human rights and human security and this uh, are part of the pillars, you know, of the European Union. Uh, at the same time, I'd like to mention, uh, don't you think that might exist a contradiction between this very beautiful discourse, you know, for human rights and solidarity that is uh, supported by the European Union and on the other hand, actions regarding refugees uh, and asylum seekers. Specifically, I'd like to mention a couple of examples. For example, the fact that the European Union for the past five years has been financing Libya to deter asylum seekers to reach its territory. And it's very well documented the conditions in which uh, refugees are leaving Libya. You know, they're being tortured, are being kept in appalling degradations, like raped, and there are all sorts of reportings. And all this financed with European Union money, specifically through you know, the uh, Coast Guard, but also uh, European Union has been investing a lot of money on that. At the same time, I'd like to mention also the conditions in which refugees, those who actually reach Europe, the conditions in which they are being treated, for example, in Greece, you know, before in the famous a uh, refugee camp at Moria, and after had its tragic end, you know, like in different now, like clo closed controlled centers, which are actually prison-like uh, refugee camps. For example, European Union is expected to invest, uh, already built one of those centers in Samos, and also in expected to finish building in four other places and has spent, is expected to spend 260 million euros to keep asylum seekers as prisons, as prisoners. So in my perspective, so I'd like to ask, where is the application of this such important and beautiful hum, uh, European Union's pillars and values regarding the respect of human rights and human security into the refugees and asylum seekers. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Fabricio. Sorry for turning on my mic, but I just want to give everybody the chance to speak. So we're going to collect the other question. And of course, Ms. Kokinakis doesn't need my help or support. I just want to mention that uh, the, 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 the theme of immigration and refugees in the European Union is a very, very complicated one. And I'm sure that Ms. Kokinakis is going to offer a great answer. But I just want to warn the audience that that is a very, very complex political issue. But I agree with you that we should hear about value-based approaches in terms of human rights protection. Can I, can you tell us your name? Good morning. I'm Andrea and I'm a student of uh, uh, political science, international relations and human rights here in Pado. And uh, I have a question for Mr. Uh, Abkamanov. And um, uh, before uh, Mr. Faber underlined the importance of, uh, of uh, being activist inside the political institutions. So taking in consideration on uh, taking uh, as you, your experience uh, as an example, as a former uh, foreign uh, minister of uh, Kazakhstan, uh, how difficult it is to, uh, to uh, put human rights uh, on the top of a political agenda, um, considering the fact that, um, considering always the fact that, that there's a uh, geographical location to consider and so that uh, inner uh, politics uh, uh, always has to face to with uh, in historical uh, relations uh, with uh, some uh, other uh, near neighbors in, in the area. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. So I, oh, we have another one. Let's collect our last question. Then we're going to have a round of answers. Thank you. Uh, my name is Karine Lennox. I'm at the University of London. My question is also for Ambassador Abdrakmanov. You mentioned in your presentation the importance of international law for the protection of minorities. At the moment, we don't have a global treaty on minorities. It's, it's still ongoing. I cannot join them. Oh, <laughs> sorry. We don't have a global treaty on minorities and we only have one region that has regional mechanisms, which many people see as weak in terms of international law provisions. So I'd just be interested to hear what reforms in international law or mechanisms would you like to see to support your mandate's aims? Thank you. Thank you to all uh, the three audience members that posed a question. I 
Uh, Ms. Kokinakis, would you like to start with the question that is for you specifically? Okay, the floor is yours. I'm sorry, your mic is off. Voila, can you hear me now? Great. Yes, we can, yes. Great, okay, thanks a lot. And apologies for, uh, before I think I was uh, not muted and my colleague came in. <laughs> so I think I uh, I crashed a bit your, uh, your conference. Apologies for that. Um, as to the question, to the first question huh, that was raised, um, well, um, to start with, uh, the External Action Service does not have a mandate for um, for the EU member states and for the human rights situation or any situation uh, related to human rights when it comes to the um, to the member states of the European Union. So our mandate in the External Action Service is truly um, external. Uh, that means that we are responsible and we follow, monitor, report, advise, discuss, negotiate with third countries, not within our own uh, constituency of the European Union. This question is more to be addressed to the, uh, well, to the, to the member states themselves. Uh, you mentioned a couple of them, so I would, uh, <laughs> I would hand over to the representatives of those uh, member states you mentioned. Um, and to the European Commission, uh, that uh, which has obviously a mandate to um, to see um, how much uh, EU member states um, uh, comply uh, with uh, with the so-called uh, acquis communautaire. So just to flag that. So uh, I'm in the lucky position not to <laughs> not to be able to say anything on that. But having said that, um, of course. Um, um, and putting it more into the global context. Huh? Um, so, so for you to get uh, to get an answer from me, um, in a global context within the UN, um, the European Union is currently facing uh, a real challenge. That is a challenge of misperception, huh? and that is um, and that is also the challenge of getting lots and lots of comments when it comes to so-called double standards. And this is. Um, uh, this is something, of course, we do not agree with. Huh? You know that the European Union is amongst the good doers uh, in the world. And globally speaking, we try to do everything as best as we can. We are the biggest humanitarian donor together with the member states um, to the UN system, etc. So, you know, you know, this part of, um, of our success story. Um, and when it comes then to the perception, very often we see that we are we are being misperceived, and we see that we need to um, to uh, face criticism when it comes to double standards. Huh? Um, we are not shying away from any any discussion or any um, any debate uh, with uh, developing countries. Th these are the ones that uh, usually um, uh, address us with this kind of uh, criticism. Um, for us, especially after UNGA 77, after the high level week, um, where all your heads of state and government uh, took part, now in September um, of this year, we see that outreach to the developing world, to the developing countries is crucial. Uh, we also, um, I also think that it's important to listen to, to the developing countries, and it's also important not only to listen, but also to take their concerns on board. Huh? And this is, I think, a good way to try to, um, to work on this misperception um, and um, to, um, to also demonstrate that that it is not us that uh, that have double standards and that all in all um, it is not um, that easy and it's not black and white um well voilà. so i hope this uh, this answers your uh, your question back to you i think it did um we now move on to the to the next questions i think the ambassador is the addressee of the of both questions, and then we can have a tour from the other speakers if they would like to add something. Well, th thank you so much. And uh, An Andrea, you you know by asking this question, by putting it forward before us and before your obedience servant in uh, servant in particular, you're demonstrating your future. You are very 
I'm quite confident you, you, you will be a great diplomat and bridge builder between nations, civilizations, ethnicities, confessions. Uh, the question which you posed really, it's of vital importance, especially today in our such a diverse world. Uh, the Pope was mentioned. I, I had the privilege to attend within one month, not a little bit, maybe more than one month period, two huge international gatherings in presence of His Holiness, the Pope, and belonging to different religion and to different civilization. I following him, even geographically, if you will, once it was in Astana, in capital of Kazakhstan, and the seventh congress of the leaders of world and traditional religions next time just a few days ago in bahrain at bahrain dialogue forum and it was not only the pope but also representatives of other religious confessions including islam judaism and other representatives been uh, present all coming with different background with different vision with different values but all you know profiting the same values, the same in our bureaucratic language, norms and principles, especially in OEC language. So, and uh, when it comes to my own experience, no, you are, you are right, especially when it, when you are, you, I mentioned to you that geopolitics uh, play a role today and sadly these geopolitics damaging badly interests not even interests but even safety and lives of every individual and uh, political vision in-depth knowledge of not only of uh, country you are talking to representatives of which you are talking in-depth knowledge of their customs traditions of their history uh, and most of nations accumulate quite a wealth of mm, knowledge when it comes how to run their diversity, the diversity of their population. Uh, you should find and to strike some kind of, you know, balance when you are raising issues, when you are uh, leading at negotiations. I did had a, um, I did have a honor to participate in launching of, for example, of Astana uh, process on peaceful settlement in Syria. And we talked and it, it, the um, negotiations took place exactly in five or seven stars hotel, but it was even more important who were around the table. And around the table were representatives, not of political, you know, parties, um, or politicians or various kind of um, stakeholders interested in settlement or in other way of situation in Syria. These were um, representatives of so-called Syrian armed opposition. Those not are residing in, you know, I will not name, you know, People residing really, they they find quite nice place for residences, uh, either in European capitals or in Middle East monarchies, or in other places. But these were people who just arrived to Astana from just leaving behind them their families, their kids, their grandparents, those who've been under siege, either under siege of some, uh, you know. Uh, army or one of uh, terrorist groups it doesn't it doesn't matter so they defended and still they are defending their own families they are alive they are not so much obsessed uh, with the political agenda of you know uh, above mentioned stakeholders and we did manage to bring them together around the really it was round table a round table when up when uh, armed opposition sitting and still it is the next round is going to take place in coming days when armed opposition of, uh, on territory of Syria sitting opposite not only to the official delegation coming 
on behalf of Syrian government, but opposite to delegation of Iran, uh, opposite to delegation of Turkey, these are uh, and Russian and against Russian generals, members part of delegation of um, uh, Russia as uh, one of guarantors of Astana process on peaceful settlement in, in Syria. Uh, uh, so it's pro probably not only about, well, obviously it's all about human rights. It's all about rights of these uh, groups on territory of Syria, uh, but it is also right of their right for their future, for their brighter future. So that's why I am always saying that it's so important to fight tuning, uh, you know, when you're tackling very much sensitive issues. Many countries are in transition, well, we should admit, but uh, even our organization, the OEC, is divided probably into the two camps, democratic one and, uh, and other still countries in transition to democracy. Uh, many countries really have quite a lot to do in order to improve their legislation, the rule of law. So finally, it's all about human rights, fundamental freedoms, democracy, and... Uh, uh, rule of law, we all admit it. So, but uh, during the negotiations, and you are quite right, it is of so it's such a high importance. And I would like to take this chance to thank. I awfully forgotten to do it because uh, in presence of European Union, United Nations funds, agencies, and programs of other stakeholders and other international organizations, I express our, our gratitude to all of them because we all trying to, in UN language, to deliver as one. And the, the, the 193 member states of the United Nations men, mentioned uh, OEC 57. I myself representing not group of, the, I'm for the first time, by the way, from my accent, it's not Oxford accent, as you see, from it's Russian accent. So I am first Russian speaking High Commission, I am first representative of the territory to the east of Vienna, which is probably also considered still not uh, full-fledged de uh, de democracy. I am first uh, time representing cent uh, Central Asia. So I am representing 57 participating states from Vancouver to Vladivostok. And that's why in my even current activity, not in the even during previous activities, obviously I did uh, take, take, take into consideration, but now it is even uh, uh, becoming even more important when I'm representing really 57 participating states and uh, especially uh, and it's bec becoming even more acute and uh, very much demanded in the time of the above mentioned uh, Russia's war against Ukraine or in many aspects uh, which are becoming overwhelming us uh, to today. Uh, uh, on, on other side, uh, when nuclear tests been conducted now we talked about nuclear, possible, you know, nuclear tragical outcome for a solution for some of ongoing war or conflict. But you, you should, uh, and I'm, I have some kind of authority as representatives of, uh, representative of the above mentioned Kazakhstan. On our territory, we, we suffered from almost 500 nuclear tests just for your axiomy palatins polygon. Almost 100 of them, 89 at least recorded number, above the ground on open air. The semi palatins polygon is 16,000 square kilometers. Just imagine how many, some even decent country could be, you know, uh, placed there. 300,000 square kilometers affected. Well, this is already quite another number. 1.5 million people suffered from nuclear tests from 1949 until 1989 or 91. So, so I have, as any Kazakh, quite a moral but authority to, you know, to call to, you know, to stop any kind of speculation on using of nuclear weapon, for example. Uh, on on, uh, on other side, uh, well, um, we are not blaming we Kazakhstanis. We are not putting blame on just only on Soviet Union, or we are well. It is blame should be shift on Cold War, on any party. 
democratic world, you know, totalitarian, authoritarian regimes of uh, those era. So there are so, so many kind of uh, such, uh, you know, thoughts emerging immediately after uh, uh, these, you know, possible speculations on possible atrocities which might happen. Uh, um, even around the corner, I see already some uh, of this. And as for the second question, well, uh, unlike academics, I'm surrounded with, I'm, uh, again, I'm more, deep, uh, I'm looking at this as historian, as a diplomat, and as a politician. Uh, I think uh, we are in the hands of you, of um, academia, think, including also think tanks. There are many ideas, obviously, uh, emerging also in the light of um, above mentioned war, conflicts, and others. Uh, probably we should, even to start with the basics, you know, there is no even definition of national minority in international legislation. And probably rightly so, it is made in a, such a vague way in order to give governments flexibility in the, to tackle. There are some issues which for every second day, today we are uh, listening to some statements on sovereignty, territorial integrity, right of nations for self-determination, self-governance. So probably this is the right time and we are suffering a lot, especially in international bureaucrats and international organizations and maybe this is one of reasons for such a so-called crisis in multilateralism, albeit I do not say this, uh, consider it as a crisis. Uh, so how to, well, address all this from sometimes quite a, you know, not quite, but legitimate demands and expectation of the above mentioned 193 member states of United Nations, 57 of uh, participating states of OEC, uh, how many in Council of Europe we have. Plus we have in, uh, many other organizations, organization of Islamic conference. So, uh, you know, some other, you know, quite influential ones. So I, I think some, some kind of more, much more clarification when it, it comes to the legal, from language to definitions and to implementation. Uh, this is what we, politicians and diplomats desperately uh, searching uh, searching for. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask to the other speakers of the panel if they would like to add something. I'm going to start with Lina Simet. Miss Simet, would you like to add anything? Is there... Your mic is off. Okay, now it now it works. Um, it didn't allow me to unmute. No, I think to end and and just to congratulate all the the other panelists for their really excellent um, interventions. I I would like to uh, just in closing um, also reiterate the the importance of reconnecting. Um, the struggles of ordinary people with the human rights movement. And I think here, as we, um, as we heard, sort of really taking the pulse and responding to people's immediate needs um, is absolutely important. And, and maybe one, um, one interesting and really inspiring to me parallel is in the, in the women's movement, where um, we we have seen decades um, of fighting against uh, patriarchal structures, um, leading also to, or demonstrating the interdependence between um, economic um, concerns as well as more um, political participation or struggles towards political participation. And here, as, as one aspect, I think recognizing um, the need to remain activist in a sense that we unfortunately cannot take many of these protections for granted. Now, as we saw even in the United States where the access to uh, reproductive rights has been severely um, impacted. So 
so again, um, the importance of, of staying involved, of pushing um, to ensure the, the continued protections of, um, of our human rights um, is therefore so important. So thank you for providing the space for the discussion today. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask the same question to uh, Mr. Jean Fabre. Would you like to add something? Well, just um, a, a short reflection on, on multilateralism. Multilateralism is not uh, a goal. It's just a means. And it's a means which is a must, simply because in a number of cases, there is no national sovereignty. It's a fiction. Uh, you have national sovereignty over certain things. But there are things over which you don't have sovereignty because if your neighbor is not involved in the same thing as, as you are concerned about, then you cannot solve the problem. So um, we're in a situation where very often uh, governments end up managing institutions, but they don't manage situations. So we have to reinvent the multilateral uh, system and we don't have to do it necessarily on a global basis. It can take different forms. And if we use the principle of subsidiarity, the decisions have to be taken closest to those concern. And it goes as far as needed. So you can have different things. And the war offers us also an opportunity to rethink certain things. Because we, we have to, uh, to raise some issues. Uh, there are, uh, it's, not, it's not just the war, it's also the situation that we have with the environment, uh, with nature, with, with the... Um, <clears throat> we now need to manage common goods and global public goods also. So we have to have a discussion even within the UN. We shouldn't try to reform the Security Council. It's a very difficult issue because there you have power games that are taking place. But if you address the issues of common goods and public goods, then you may have a different approach. Think that in your lifetime, the youngest pe people in this room, you may see a change which has been unthinkable for centuries. The fact that the resources that are where you sit sort of belong to you. But there will be some resources from the, the ground that will, be, will have to be considered as belonging to the entire humankind and will have to be managed as such because you cannot have that as the property of somebody who makes a deal with whoever she or he wants. Um, it's, there are vital things that are needed by all. So going into that situation forces us to rethink our multilateral in institutions. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna close my round asking Professor Namur if he wants to add last comment. up your right to speak so you make me more popular with the crowd because that means that the chair is no longer standing between you and lunch i want to use this opportunity to thank you once again both you in person here and those online thank you to all it was a great pleasure and an honor to chair this round table thank you very much